When I think back to my elementary school years, I have a lot of fond memories. Discovering wonderful books like A Bridge to Terabithia and Johnny Tremaine, enjoying Friday nights with my best friend at her house where we'd stay up talking for hours and then devouring her mom's chocolate chip pancakes the following morning and having my grandparents over to celebrate birthdays and holidays with my parents and me. One thing I did not enjoy about elementary school, however, was gym class. I am not and have never been athletic, something I felt deeply in gym. While I may have been one of the first people chosen by my classmates for an academic project, I was one of the last when it came to sports. When we picked teams to run relays or play dodgeball, I found myself waiting and waiting for my name to be called. I can still feel the eyes of my peers on me as I struggled toward the finish line or the thwack of that red rubber ball as it hit me. Gym class taught me important lessons about humility and recognizing my limits. But thinking about this experience years later still stings a little bit. In today's gospel, Jesus tells a story about people who also found themselves among the last to be chosen. A landowner goes out five times during the day and hires people to tend to his vineyard, offering to pay them whatever is right or the usual wage. They agree. The work sounds hot and probably unpleasant, so it's no surprise that they want to be compensated fairly. But those who start early in the day assume the landowner will reward them based solely on the number of hours they work. They assume the landowner values their work more because they were first and there longer. In making these assumptions, though, they miss a few key points. They miss that the landowner realizes during the day that he needs more and more people to do the work not just the ones who showed up early. They missed that the workers who no one had hired weren't just hanging out relaxing, but were probably feeling a little lost, useless, and left behind. The workers the landowner approached at 5 p.m. were the last of the last, the passed over and forgotten. And still, he found a need for their labor even for just an hour. When we think about our work, we often feel like our worth is measured by how much time we put in. We think about how many hours we worked overtime this week, how many emails we answered when we should have been watching our kids' soccer game, or talking with our spouse, or even getting some sleep. We feel good about being busy and checking items off of our to-do list and our Protestant work ethic. And of course, because we were working so hard and so tirelessly, we feel like we are doing more than our fair share compared to everyone else. In our race to show our boss how valuable and productive we are, we unwittingly pit ourselves against others in an either-or situation where only we should get the gold star, or the raise, or the corner office. It's obvious to us. Don't others see it too? This is certainly how the human economy works, but it is not how God works. God doesn't ask us to fill out our timesheet every pay period. God doesn't base our worth on how many hours we bill or how many reports we churn out or how many contracts we sign and how that compares to the person down the hall. God is not in the competition. Instead, God's economy is a both and system based on love. There is as much love for those our economy ignores, the poor, the weak, the friendless, 
as to those whom it prizes, the wealthy, the powerful, the connected. There is as much love for the person who spends their whole life caring for their family as the one who brings home a hefty paycheck. There is as much love for those who come to God early in their lives as to those who answer his call on their deathbed. God's economy is based on abundance, not scarcity. It's based on generosity, not stinginess. And it's an economy where all are equally welcomed and valued and treasured. From those who've spent many years in the vineyard to the ones like Teddy, who will be baptized today, whose time is just beginning. As one preacher notes, the first shall be last and the last shall be first because indeed there is no person who is last or least in the kingdom of heaven. And as author Richard Rohr adds, how can you be last when you belong to the whole body? In a few minutes, I want you to join me in a very simple demonstration of how the last shall be first and the first shall be last. When we usually approach the altar for communion, the ushers dismiss from the front of the church to the back. Today, we'll do the opposite with the back rows coming up first and the front rows going up last. Don't worry, the ushers know about this and they'll guide you. As you experience this reversal, I invite you to think about how it feels to be called up first if you're in the back instead of waiting for everybody else. And if you're in the front rows who are used to having communion first, think about how it feels to watch others go up while you wait until it's finally your turn. In God's love-based economy, there is room for everyone at the table, or in the vineyard, wherever and whenever they show up. There is no first or last. Everyone is valued equally. Everyone is loved fully. Everyone receives the same promise of eternal life. It's an economy that is always expanding, always bullish, and will never run out of capacity to grow. What a great system.